um, something that I find, find usually impressive about the film is um, you celebrate the music so brilliantly and there's, ele there's moments in the film that I just felt absolutely floored by, you know, Evelyn Shambank in singing Shame for one of them. I was just absolutely floored at that moment. I thought it was brilliant. At the same time, you celebrate that music while putting it in the social and political context. And beyond that, you accept that at times it was ridiculous. And, and you know, it, it was fun as well, you know, fun and ridiculous and daft and all those things. Um, is that the film, is with the all those your intentions when you set out to make the film, or did the film evolve like that? Well, it was it was certainly certainly the most complex uh, um, project I've done. It's my fifth film, and it's it was definitely the the trickiest because of all those all those elements that I was I was hoping to get at. As I mentioned earlier, it it I didn't set out initially to propose a film on disco at all, so I was kind of assigned the topic. I knew it was a topic that would have lots of potential, you know, just the pictures, the music, a fun time, a period of history. But then to actually find something to sink one's teeth into, to, to look at the era fresh, I was relieved to, a friend sent me, uh, a friend who's now the sales agent of the film, sent me uh, uh, the first revisionist history that came out, Peter Shapiro's book. The next came out while I was working on it. And I began to just think initially, well, there's got, when, when you start hearing phrases like psychic, psychic intifada against the rules of gay life before <laughs> disco, and you start you know, imagining that slapped up against uh, footage of Barry White, you know there's a bit of fun to be had. Um, so I, I did kind of initially think there's gonna be, there's gonna be some, you know, I, I, as most people, when I, tell, when I tell them what the film is about, I tell them it's about this, you know, it was this misunderstood, disco was a misunderstood time of protest and liberation. Their first reaction is, huh? And uh, that was mine. And I kind of grudgingly gained some respect for these theories. Obviously, I don't dismiss them completely, or you can't, and if I thought it was complete bullshit, you couldn't stretch it over, over a feature film. But it, it was, yes, so I did intend to have many layers, and I do tend to make films with irony to them. Uh, the other films I've made I've actually been in, which, which poses its own challenges, but at least affords you a kind of natural narrative tool uh, um, to y uh, uh, from which to, to approach the irony, to give it an ir a natural ironic voice. This was much tri uh, trickier. I realized it would not be good for anyone if I appeared in a film about disco. <laughs> and, uh, uh, but it was trickier to, because you realize dealing with kind of classic documentary tools, uh, you know, the interview and stock footage and so on, wonderful and, and out there as all this stuff was, uh, uh, that still, traditionally, you documentaries are things that present an accepted truth, and you've got your figures of authority, and they're telling you how things were. And as soon as you try to undermine that anyway, it kind of it it fucks with the narrative of it because if you're not going to trust, if you if you make them look too untrustworthy, then why should you stick with them? For why should the audience stick with them for the next 85 minutes? So, yes, I intended to do it, but it took a long time in editing to figure out the way to, to pull it off, which hopefully to some degree we did. Um, <coughs> and before we take questions from the audience, I just want to mention the, the village people in the film. Mm -hmm. And you know, you talk about irony and, and how you want to bring that into the film. And they seem to deny you the opportunity to be ironic about their work. Was that me? Was are, are you kidding? <laughs> I think they handed it to me on a plate. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but, but they insist there, w there was no, you know, well, that was a, that was a real surprise. I mean, that was certainly my most surprising encounter in the film. Mm. Was I, I went in there with a long list of questions, and I thought this was just going to be the conversation opener. I mean, it hardly seems a radical suggestion. As I say, I could care less. I wasn't interested in, in what their personal sexual orientation is, but to say in the Navy, macho man. I mean, to suggest that this this is part of gay iconography of the '70s or whatever she called it. Is is hardly a radical notion. So I just thought that was the warm up question, and I, you know, I mean, you just see it unfolding pretty well as it as it did. Where I never got past question number three. No, I had a I had a wonderful, a, a very senior, wonderful Emmy nominated at least a, a visual researcher and a whole team of researchers working on this stuff and scouring scouring through things. And I think that that came. God knows how that turned up. Oh, you know what? Actually, that one specifically. So, so I mean, they'd be going through all the traditional sources, and then one thing would suggest another, and ideas would come in the script, or you'd read about them in books, and then try to track something down. And YouTube is, is kind of a curse and a blessing, because there's everything's out there. 
but then that doesn't mean you're cleared. It's easy to clear to use for a film. You know, it raises a whole other can of worms. But that thing came from, in fact, that was a late addition. Wh after I interviewed Henri Bellolo, the producer, he mentioned it. He said the Navy, the Navy <laughs> really did want to use it as a promotional video <laughs> to encourage <laughs> recruitment. Um, and so they gave them access to this warship to shoot the film that was all gratis and it was <laughs> meant to be. So he told me about that and he told me about the special and he told me about the time where, where the Navy were really on board, so to speak. And, um, and then someone in the Navy PR kind of said, uh, uh, excuse me, uh, Commissioner, or whatever the hell, uh, Admiral, uh, you know, this may not be the best campaign for what we're trying to promote. Uh, and it was all, yeah, it was canned as a, <laughs> as a recruitment campaign. Anyway, it was something that he raised in the interview that we then went and tracked down. Somebody had it in their personal collection. Well, it speaks to, uh, no, it's a good question. It's, it's uh, I find in, in the way I work anyway, uh, frustratingly, the, the, the ultimate voice and tone of the thing is the last thing to fall into place. It's extremely frustrating because you're working on it six to eight months in editing and, and, you, uh, and you've got kind of like all the cars of the train built and then you need to somehow get it onto the track and until then it just feels horrible. Uh, so this, this goes back to that challenge of trying to find a way to bring the right degree of of uh, a, a narrative voice that could both be, you know, tell the story, do, do the basic job of, of exposition, and still kind of question things with a, with a light enough touch. And it, and it just stemmed from, you know, so I always struggle with that voice, with the tone, with the script, with the title, it all kind of fits together, or for a long time does not fit together. And it just came from, from, the, from the thought of, well, I mean, if all this were, were happening, if there, there really was, a, I mean, just the kind of amusing thought in the writing process one day that, well, if it was if this revolution happened that, that uh, nobody was aware of, well, clearly there must have been masterminds puppeteering the entire thing. And then, you know, once you're, you know, you're smoking, once you're smoking that Kool-Aid, um, uh, uh, you kind of go, well, I guess it would only be responsible to try to create the world of those masterminds uh, for, the, for the public. The public needs to know and see what they must have looked like. Yeah, so it came late in the process, yeah, when I was, you know, insane. How difficult was it to clear the footage? It was, uh, if I may sum it up, sir, in one word, a rights mare. Mm -hmm. um, it, uh, or is that the Tim Burton movie that's <laughs> playing concurrently? Anyway, um, <coughs> yeah, it was, again, I just, we, we had, uh, as you can see by, again, <laughs> reliving the, the funding struggles, watching the, the credits go, go by, although I was quite lucky, as one certainly isn't always in this uh, wonderful business. Um, <coughs> I had, there were a lot of, it, it, I had a decent budget, and I, I had experts working on it, and we, you know, we just slogged through it. But that, you know, all of that informed to some degree the editing choices, you know, stuff that was available, stuff that could be, could be uh, could be cleared in a certain way. I mean, there was some, and there's lots of stuff I wasn't I wasn't able to use. You know, uh, there was uh, oh, there was some wonderful Brazilian TV footage of of the hustle that we had found with these beautiful dancers. What, whatever it was, there was a great piece of KC. There was one Dutch TV show called. Uh, uh, it's important to have some Dutch content in every movie, I think, as well as Hitler, um, and. Um, there was this Dutch TV show called Top Pop that just went to town with this stuff. They, that's the th like the thing with Donna Summer surrounded by the six ethereal silver clad dancers is from that. They just built sets, you know, nothing too good for their disco stars. And they did, they built this crazy thing with this, with Casey and the Sunshine Band. It looked like a basement rec room, but then eventually they pull out and reveal it's just a tiny corner of the stage and it's covered in whipped cream. And I don't know. Yeah, so, so there was often stuff that we couldn't use, but I mean, there was such a, 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 an overabundance of riches that we found enough to you know, make it. Because I felt also this had to kind of be definitive. It was, in spite of its wacky nature, I still wanted it to be, you know, which is not something I've set out to do before, you know, a kind of definitive, offbeat, wacky film about disco. Well, actually, as I, th as I say, this is my fifth uh, kind of original doc, and um, it's, it, was it was the highest budget I've done, and it was the e relatively speaking, it's never easy, but it was the easiest to finance. 
after I got the notion of Harold Pinter, you know, beaten out of me, uh, it, it became kind of, you know, you try to find things, uh, you know, those of us who do this that are kind of a combination of what you want to do and something the market will fund. I mean, unless you, you know, if you don't want to starve. So uh, uh, pop docs are in or were in at this time. And I, you know, I had a background as a music critic. I thought I could, I could kind of make this work. I've done music, a music documentary before. Um, but it was kind of a one-word pitch. I mean, you say disco and people just get it. Uh, um, it, it, so in that regard, it was it was relatively relatively easy to finance. It was an odd experience for me because I, I was doing it back to back with uh, with another film that hasn't come out here, unfortunately, but has all, uh, other places uh, called uh, Recessionize for Fun and Profit, kind of ironic film about about the financial crisis, and that was a nightmare to finance. And, and so I had this bizarre thing. I was really like doing financing yoga, yoga and borrowing from disco to pay for that. And it was all, you know, it's a crazy business. It really is. Anyway, you slice it, you know. And I'll, now I'll probably never work again. Thanks for bringing it up. <laughs> <laughs>